Does Vidania Americans In a year we're gonna have like the Will Ferrell Amy Poehler movie Quarantine. But it's <laughs> T-E-E-N and it's got the chick from Stranger Things in it. Yo, what is going down? Welcome to Owls at Dawn. We are just two dudes from Southern California who studied philosophy, politics, and religion around the world and decided to start a podcast where we could bullshit with impunity. I am Austin Hayden Smith. And I'm Troy Polidori. And this is the Rona episode. We're going to talk about that Rona shit. <laughs> is that the Isn't official that like... nickname now? Oh, I think so, man. There I needs to be so. a better nickname for this thing. They, they're calling it That Rona. It's just that Rona is how I Yeah, but heard like it. the plague was called the Black Death. I mean, that's fucking badass as shit, dude. We need a better nickname for this thing. Well, how about it's something to do with how you can't breathe when it fucks with you. Breathless? Nah, that's like a, a French New Wave film. <laughs> it, yeah, Suff- something about suffocation. Yeah. yeah, so some like death metal band needs to get on this. Did you hear there was a dude that was talking about, like, in the age of coronavirus, he wants to start a ska band and call it Ska-rona? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was like, that's I, so I, I'm not sure ska works with, like, plagues and diseases. Ska-rona, man. Yeah, I know. It's There's too much levity in just the... Dee, 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 dee. <laughs> yeah, you can only be happy and oblivious to suffering in the world when you're, you know, skanking. Exactly. Yeah, so we're going to talk about, like, the Zizek essay, and I'm going to force Troy to talk about the Agamben essay that everyone's freaking out about. And, of course, we're going to talk about, you know, probably Trump and China and Australia and the UK and various other governments and the measures they've taken to combat this issue. I mean, we'll talk a little bit about the medical stuff, but basically we just wanted to have a kind of open, honest discussion about how we're feeling about things our own anxieties and struggles and worries um, our students worries things that we've read and see if we have any sort of theoretical meat that we can chew on at the same time so uh yeah so stick around for that because we're going to be jumping into the whole pandemic and response to the pandemic issue over the next hour or so yeah before that though we want to talk a little bit about uh our sponsor movie right that's right so yeah so for those of you that no, uh, we are sponsored by Mubi. Those of you that don't know, Mubi is an online streaming service. And basically the way they operate is rather than have just a whole library, they have 30 perfectly curated films. And they do what we have t- termed here a slaughterhouse rotation, which means there's 30 films at a time. Each film gets a 30-day rotation. And at the end of the, the rotation, one film drops off, which means that there is a new film that is generated every single day. So every day a film drops off, a new film comes in, but there's 30 perfect uh perfectly curated like indie films classics of cinema uh, regional darlings they do spotlights on like famous directors or avant-garde or uh, other artists that you might not be familiar with they do documentaries they do narrative films they do everything but it's always high quality film and so i don't really know any of the films that are currently in my library but there is a film by orson welles and just seeing a film by Orson Welles, it's called Chimes at Midnight. I'm not familiar with, and you're not familiar with this either, right, Troy? Right. So I don't know it, but apparently Orson Welles himself said that this was his favorite of his own films. So huh. I know it's kind of interesting, um, but it made me think just about Welles himself as kind of a – he's one of those guys that I feel like we forget about, right? Like everyone talks about Citizen Kane, but I feel like people forget about Welles outside of Citizen Kane. Don't you think? Yeah, maybe. I like. I mean, I feel like Touch of Evil and um, what else is like a super famous film. Well, but the, I, they talk. But like when people are talking about the great directors, right? Like he kind of doesn't get mentioned. You know, I, I almost feel like like I've seen some amazing video essays and things like that where people are talking about some of the brilliance of of his films, right? Um, but I just feel like he doesn't quite get the attention. It's almost like he shot his whole wad with Citizen Kane. And then after that, people are like, oh, there's a great opening shot in this film. Or there's some great character work in this film. Or some good acting in this film. But I feel like he's not really appreciated for his au revoir. Like you get somebody like, I don't know, like a Scorsese or like a Ford or something like that, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, you get like Third Man and Touch of Evil and stuff like that as like, you know, uh, little mentions here and there. But you don't, I guess, you don't see him as as the um, the full ouvroir as much. Yeah, and I always wonder why that is. I don't know. Maybe it's just that the quality of his stuff doesn't maintain, but I always find him intriguing, and I was actually talking about it with Troy before we started recording, but my favorite thing that he ever did is called F for Fake, which is this weird kind of experimental documentary that starts out one way and then turns into something very different. And I don't want to give too much away, but it's called F for Fake because it's all about this art forger, this really famous art forger. Um, but it kind of explores the very medium of film itself. And when I saw that, that actually is what gave me an appreciation, like a rekindled appreciation for Wells. So anyway, there's a Wells film here, and because I have this new appreciation for Wells, I'm going to probably check it out. It's called Chimes at Midnight. And so what Mubi is offering for our listeners is that if you are interested in these types of film, classics of cinema, regional films indie darlings, uh, kind of more experimental avant-garde stuff. If you're interested in that stuff, go to Mubi, and to get a 30-day free trial, if you just go to Mubi.com slash Owls at Dawn, you can get access to that. So it's Mubi, M-U-B-I dot com slash Owls at Dawn, and you'll be able to get a 30-day free trial. So we'll see you at the Mubi's. Hardy, har, <laughs> har. <laughs> So, uh, Austin, um, you've yeah. got some pretty big personal news to share with the audience, yeah? Yeah, so I touched my first penis the other day. Um, <laughs> no. Um, so I've been – for those of you who that have, that have either followed me for a while or that have followed the podcast for a while, you would know this, but I don't talk about it too much because it's just been this really long project and there haven't been too many updates that I could give. But I have been um, developing and producing – the cinematic adaptation of the best-selling book Inventing the Future, Post-Capitalism and a World Without Work. And so we've been adapting it into an experimental documentary. I mean, it's hardly a documentary in any standard sense. It's not a talking headpiece. It's more of an experimental avant-garde cinematic adaptation of this book. And it's called Inventing the Future. And um, the original plan was is that we were going to premiere it at the Berlin film festival but timing kind of got messed up with uh, us being able to give the edit to the programmers in time and then the idea was is that we would just then try to roll it out at the film festivals that either take place in the summer like early summer late summer or potentially even um, early fall so that would be like Locarno TIFF in the fall or like Cannes or something like that in the summertime but obviously the uh, film world is in shambles at the moment festivals are postponed or canceled movie theater houses are all closed and shit like that plus at the same time we kind of want to do something that isn't reliant on the gatekeepers of the cinematic world and so we decided to just release it for all for free on youtube so the entire feature is up on youtube if you just go to youtube and type in inventing the future it's live so go check that shit out it's this kind of crazy left accelerationist experimental avant-garde montage style film that is adapting the ideas and the concepts and the themes of the book into the cinematic form and the cinematic language and it is directed by um, the experimental filmmaker Isaiah Medina whose previous feature 8888 uh, premiered at Locarno and then played TIFF and then New York Film Festival and was on like top 10 lists for the end of the year in 2015 for being the best avant-garde or experimental film. So he's been heaped with praise and we were so fortunate to be able to hire him to come on board and to kind of make this concept become a reality. And he himself is so fucking stoked. He's like, honestly, I've never had any more satisfaction or joy in any project that I've ever completed. So he's beyond out of his mind excited to have released this film. And especially in the way that we did it. Because it kind of came together in the last couple weeks because of all of this chaos that is uh, kind of halted, if you will, the world of cinema. And he's like, you know what? Fuck it. Let's just throw this out there as one, a grenade, uh, also as kind of a fuck you, but also more importantly, as a tool for people who are stuck in isolation and who can have access to a film that is talking about the future and talking about ecological issues and talking about universal basic income and all these other things that are so in the kind of four of our public consciousness at the moment so yeah it's online so go check that shit out just go to inventing the future on youtube and you'll be able to see this film it's a wild ride it's crazy as fuck so be prepared and then enjoy and you couldn't have really chosen uh, a more opportune time given uh the public consciousness for this to be something that's uh you know part of the discourse now right 100 percent 
Hundred percent. I mean, you've got Canada that's giving out like four months of uh, a type of basic income. You've got the states that's promising to give out helicopter money. Australia's talking about helicopter money. Um, the UK is probably going to have to put some sort of stimulus package together. I think other states are going to follow suit. And then the question is: Is will this become something that is more of like an integral policy that gets advocated for? I mean, obviously you've got Yang and stuff like that who has kind of been talking about it for the past year or so, who made it something that was even mentioned in like. Um, you know, mainstream media shows, which it was never talked about seriously before. And it opened up some really important debates about universal basic income versus like universal basic services and the welfare system. You know, you've got like the conservative Charles Murray version that is like dismantle the welfare state and just give people a thousand bucks so they live in poverty and then have to pay for all their health care and shit. And then you have the left accelerationist version that is like, no, how about we do both? And there's some really interesting arguments that the book and that the film try to explore, not as the final word or like um, a discursive declaration, but I think much more as a tool, as an experimental hyperstition, an image to think through and to provoke thought and to provoke debate and stimulation of mind and thought and hopefully then translating into praxis. So it's a perfect time and also I think the way that we dropped it is actually really kind of exciting. You know, even though it'll still probably play festivals and things like that on the back end, uh, the people from Locarno apparently saw it and they loved it. So, um, uh, so I'm sure it'll play at some of the fests, which is also good just in terms of like prestige, because that shit still matters in the world of cinema, unfortunately. But at the same time, we're kind of doing it on our own terms right now, which is really exciting. You know? Yeah, getting the guerrilla stuff on the on the front end, and then getting some you know, some uh, public recognition up the grand scale, up the back end would be like the best of both worlds, right? Yeah, and as far as I know, this would be the first time that you get a film that premieres on fucking YouTube and then plays like Locarno or TIFF, <laughs> you know? Yeah, like, which could only happen ha now because the rules are going to get relaxed. About that That's right. Imagine. Yeah. yeah, so it's kind of crazy to be at the forefront of all of this, on the front lines of this, and we were actually talking about this. We actually theorized that this kind of thing might happen, and we were really excited thinking about, oh wow, what if we were on the cutting edge of this new stage of what cinema might be? Like, what is cinema in an age of lockdown, or in an age of digital technology, or in an age of, like, coronavirus, as silly as that might sound? Like, what is film and cinema? Like, funding has been cut off by so many films. They're talking about releasing Wonder Woman online and all of these other things. Like, is that the same if you don't go to the theater and if you don't have the red carpet premieres and all of that other stuff that we typically associate with cinema, but rather it's people sitting at home, you know, drinking a beer with their family and their friends and their loved ones, doing live streams over Zoom or various other like hosting platforms that can, where they can talk about shit. Like, what does it mean to live in the digital age, the information age, and do art? And not just to produce art, but to also participate in the consumption of art. And I think that's something that we're really excited to be able to explore in a, in a kind of creative and productive way. Yeah, you know, like you said, um, uh, what's what's film in like the age of coronavirus and stuff like that, age of lockdown and quarantine? This is like the, the first like major piece of media um, that's made for talking about this era, right? Like in mm -hmm. a year, we're going to have like the Will Ferrell, Amy Poehler movie quarantine but it's <laughs> t-e-e-n it's got the chick from stranger things in it and that's, that's going to be like the movie that's about coronavirus the first movie about coronavirus right but then yeah. you got that first right that's it was right. like you yeah. shot a movie in like a week yeah and there's a difference between something being about something as though it's a representation of it and something being an expression of the anxieties of the time and I think yeah. our film, I actually, I, so I've rewatched the film obviously a couple times, but I rewatched it last night and I rewatched it with my Bose, or not my Bose, my Beats headphones on, which was really interesting, you know, because I watched it the first time on my iPhone. I watched it the second time um, on my iPad and I watched it last night again on my iPad, but with my headphones on. And it was amazing because there's a lot of really clever audio editing stuff, right? But <laughs> there was something else that happened that I didn't notice. And I actually had to message Isaiah after I saw it. I, there was a tenderness to it that I hadn't noticed before. There was this affective sweetness and subtle, tender dealing with the themes that really seemed to issue from a care and a concern for a better world. And not that I obviously didn't know that. I mean, fuck, the reason that I optioned the script and or the, the book in the first place and that we turned this into a, a project in the first place is because we have political commitments. But or and social commitments just beyond the political and the explicit sense right but for some reason it didn't hit me as hard as it hit me last night and this is the first time i've seen it since the lockdown 
So I don't know if it's just the times and the anxiety that's in the air amongst my students and my family and my friends and my, you know, people who follow me on Twitter and uh, mutuals and things like that. I don't know if that like affected me or primed me in a particular way to make it more emotional for me. But there was a tenderness about it that hit me this time that I didn't get in the first couple viewings that I've that I had of the full edit. Like obviously I've seen clips of it for years, um, but the full edit hadn't hit me in an emotional sense. I mean, the first time I saw it, I cried, but that was more just because I was so proud that we <laughs> yeah. fucking finally finished it and I cried a lot. But um, but this hit me in a different way. It was almost like the reception of the expression of the tenderness and dealing with the anxieties just really got pushed to the fore. And I thought it was really interesting and I had to tell him that and he said, wow, he's like, I'm really glad to hear you say that. He's like, that's amazing. So, you know, it's, it's not just an abstract highbrow, high-minded, philosophical, experimental exploration. It is that, but there's just a real, the only word I can think of is there's a tenderness about it as well that, that I think is very subtle. And I've, I, I haven't seen too many reviews mention it. A couple have, but, um, but it really hit me hard last night for whatever reason. And maybe it's one of those things that only happens on like repeat viewings, you know, because you're so maybe overwhelmed the first time. I don't know. I, I think it'll just it'll hit people in in different ways, and I'm kind of excited to continue to see the reviews. So, yeah. Yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited to do an episode on this uh, eventually. Uh, I've kind of been waiting to watch it to think about whether or not I want it to be fresh, like right before we do an episode on it. Mm. Um, so we'll have to talk about that. And uh, yeah, I'm excited to relay my thoughts and feelings and reactions to it as well. I've been hearing about this thing for so long, right? <laughs> Basically edging. So. Four years, bro. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I remember where I was. I was in Scotland in the library at the University of Dundee reading Inventing the Future, the book. And I know Nick and Alex, the authors of the book, because I had been involved with some conferences, organizing some conferences in Scotland that they attended and gave papers at. So I knew them at a, at a you know, like a collegiate or a collegial. What, what's the word I'm looking for? I, I knew them as colleagues, <laughs> kind yeah. of, right? Um and I reached out after I read the book and I said, and I had just finished, this is when I moved back to the UK after being in the States working as a producer at the production company. And I said to them, I said, this needs to be made into a documentary. And I was working on documentaries and like online content primarily, doing some TV and some film stuff as well. But mostly it was like documentary or reality based stuff. So my mind was kind of already in that, in that that vein in that mode and I reached out to them and I said have you considered turning this into a documentary and they said yes and that was about four years ago and the, I met with Alex in London and we chatted about ideas and things like that and then we got Isaiah on the board probably you know four or six months later and now here we are crazy yeah dude I'm so glad it's finally come to fruition me too. <laughs> I had to, I had to stop. I released it the other night. We released it at like a coordinated time at 12 p.m. Eastern on Monday, right? And um, and immediately I started like emailing people and letting them know, you know, like I'm emailing, emailing Verso, the book publisher that publishes the book, and I'm emailing them and I'm emailing like all these other people that have been waiting for it. I'm sending messages to people and stuff like that. And then I'm responding to people on Twitter and whatnot that are talking about it or on Facebook or whatever. And I, did, I had a moment where I just had to, and I'm, and then I'm like Skyping with Isaiah at the same time. And we're talking about like, how exciting is this and shit like that. And so we're like sending, so I, it was just go, 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 go. And I just had to stop for a second. And I put my phone down and I was like, wait a second. Like, because it wasn't an in-person premiere. Like if the first time that it was ever shown was at a film festival, like Locarno or TIFF or something like that, you get to bask in the release right mm -hmm. and and that's great but i didn't have that moment where i could bask and i and i re like i spent about the first 15 20 minutes just not even appreciating what had just happened and then i was like wait a second just pause for a second and i put my phone and i set it down and i flipped it over and as soon as i did that i started crying <laughs> <laughs> that's basking in the age of lockdown dude yeah dude i just i just got overwhelmed um and then of course i'm looking around me and I don't remember what time it was. I think it was like 3.30 in the morning or something like that at that point here. And I didn't have any like booze or anything like that. But I really wanted like some fucking champagne or some wine just to like <laughs> celebrate. And I was like, oh, no, I don't have it. But I was like, ah, fuck it. It's okay. It, this is great. This is great. But like it took me a minute to actually appreciate the long journey that kind of came to fruition in the way that it did. But yeah, so I'm babbling. We can stop talking about this. But go check it out. Go to YouTube, Inventing the Future, and uh, enjoy that shit. Yeah. So, so what have you been up to for the last corona month? Corona stuff, dude. 
I mean, do you want to do that, or do you want to talk about what you've been up to for the last little while here? I got nothing like releasing a fucking feature film, dude. Um, yeah, I mean, I've basically been on been on lockdown here in the states. Uh, yeah, we luckily had spring break right in the beginning of this whole thing, so we kind of had a week to get things set up. But the last couple, we just been been doing everything over over Zoom, just like you're doing in Australia. Yeah. So it's a it's it's a bit. I'm interested to talk about the differences experiencing it um, here in the states versus. I mean, you're experiencing both sort of the uh, the Australian, um, you know, reaction to it, but then also the American version over the internet, right? So I'm curious yeah. to see about the differences and reactions between Aussies and Americans, and what it's like to to view the American situation through the lens of you know being um, a foreign national, and also, uh, and especially. What is it like for other countries to see what the U.S. is doing and the U.S.'s response? Since uh, whenever the the states do something, it's not just going to affect their citizens; it's going to affect the whole world, right? So, totally, um, that's a whole different situation as well. Um, yeah, but yeah. I guess let's let's start with talking about. Um, I guess yeah. Let's start talking about the the Australian situation. Like, I think anyone who's listening to this probably has a a fairly good idea what the American situation is. You know, basically. Um, what are things like in Australia? So it's, it's seemed very prolonged in, in the sense of their response, right? Like it wasn't immediate imposition of lockdown or social distancing orders or in the recommendation to self-isolate or anything like that. It started with travel restrictions from, uh, people coming from China. And that actually really affected us because we have a shitload of Chinese students who come here to study. Like yeah, the University of Sydney, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like the University of Sydney in particular is like, like I had a class last year that I taught where I shit you not, I'd say 40%, 30% of my students were Chinese. And in my class that I'm teaching now, I'd say 20% are. So we have a shitload of Chinese undergrads and graduate students who come. And when the virus broke out and affected Wuhan, it was right in between terms, which mean two things. One, you have a shitload of students who were back home visiting family. And then two, you have a shitload of new students coming in, preparing to come in. Now, we're backwards from the Northern Hemisphere, which means that this was the beginning of our school year. So January or February when we started, end of February, beginning of March, is the beginning of our school year. The spring semester for you guys is actually the fall semester for us and vice versa, mm -hmm. right? So we're beginning our fall semester. And so all of these students, because of these travel restrictions, were trapped in China. So that was the first thing that started to become really serious from my perspective where I was like, oh, fuck, well, what are we going to do with all these students? So the university was kind of scrambling to make – to make adjustments to allow for them to get access to lectures. I mean, we already record all of our lectures online anyway, so they can get those. Um, but it was to make sure that they could have access to tutorial groups and um, to any assignments or presentations that would have required in-person participation. Now it was getting transferred to the online. And so, you know, the university tried its best. But in terms of actual people getting sick here, it really wasn't until the end of March, I'd say around the 20th or so, between the 15th and 20th, 14th and 20th, something like that, when it started to become something where people were like, okay, we might need to take this seriously and start imposing fines for people being outside and imposing lockdowns. And then state governments have acted independently because they do have some measure of independence. So like the New South Wales government came out with, thousand dollar fines if you're not self-isolating or social distancing or if you're running business operations you could even get fined up to five thousand if you're the owner of the business so there was like a massage parlor here uh, for people who don't know prostitution is legal here so the massage parlors they also do like happy endings and they can be they, they have escort services and shit like that um but one of the massage parlors that at least one that we know of got reported on um like the owners got fined like five thousand bucks and a couple of the patrons were fined a thousand i think maybe a couple of the girls were fined a thousand bucks i don't know the all the details but i know that they got kind of they got dinged a bit for that so it started to ramp up i'd say within the last two weeks and then especially the last week or so it started to really become apparent when they actually imposed lockdown i was actually i was out 
and I was at a cafe doing social distancing, don't worry, with a buddy of mine, but we were sitting outside and we were actually playing a game where we had a bucket and we were just, there was literally nobody there and we were just like throwing sticks into the bucket and I was drinking <laughs> like Bloody Marys and shit and, uh, and so that's what we were doing and we were just sitting outside and the owner came up or one of the guys came up that works there and was like, yo, as of like tomorrow, uh, everything is locked down, all essential businesses and things like that are closed and we were like, okay, fuck. So now I had been self-isolating prior to that, I'd say about I had been sick for people who don't know. I actually had some mild flu like symptoms. And so I totally self isolated for a couple of weeks a little bit earlier than most people did here. I was on like the, uh, I don't know, I was on like the Italian schedule or something like that. Um, <laughs> but I just was doing it just one for my own benefit, but also just in case I did have it. I didn't want to get anybody else sick or anything like that. Um, and then I started feeling a lot better. And then I would kind of, you know, I, I was like, oh, well, maybe I'll go out and I'll go to a cafe and I'll still do the social distancing thing. But, you know, it, it, I'll uh, I'll be responsible about it, but I'll, I'll be able to go out. And then this happened and I was like, fuck, man. And then I actually had an Uber driver who uh, I was talking with who was an older gentleman and he was like 76, I think. And we had a conversation and I was like, why are you doing this? You shouldn't be driving an Uber right now if, <laughs> if you're fucking 76 and shit. And he's like, yeah, how but do you I know him. how old your Uber drivers are, dude? <laughs> well, we we had a conversation. We had a long conversation. He used to like own a business and he like worked in America for all these years. We had a long conversation. Well, not a long conversation, <laughs> but a very fruitful conversation. Um, and then we agreed as he dropped me off that he would stop driving and that I would self-isolate. And so that was, I don't know what, a week and a half ago or whatever it was, almost two weeks ago now. Um, and so I've been, uh, I've been like more hardcore self-isolating since then. So... Um, but there's more of a, a panic in the air, you know, toilet paper shortages and there's no food in the grocery stores and shit like that. Same story everywhere. Um, definitely anxiety. I've been talking with a lot of people. Um, and then for me, the thing that's that's been the biggest effect that I've seen, um, you know, they have a stimulus package that they've proposed. But one of the things is I happen to know a lot of uh, people who are either from Latin America or from Europe who are either studying here or who come to work here on some kind of working visa. And the problem is, is most of them now have been laid off or their hours have been dramatically cut and they're not eligible for the government stimulus packages. So you have a couple of like ripple effects that come from this. One, they're having difficulty paying rent and there are shitloads of them. Like if you come to Austra uh, come to Sydney in particular, it's a transient city. There are just so many foreign people here because it's such a cosmopolitan place. And many of them are temporary, like they're here for a year or two to work, or they're here to learn English for a year or two, and then they go back to their country, right? Or some of them come and they, they want to stay and they start off, you know, for a year or two, and then they have plans to maybe stay longer. And what this is basically doing is fucking a lot of them over on a couple of fronts because one, they're having difficulty paying rent and for food and things like that. But also, they're having difficulty paying for their English classes, or they're having difficulty paying for these other business classes that they take that aren't affiliated with universities, but are these kind of, uh, I don't know, like para-university institutions that give them credits and give them training so that they can continue to learn English, but then also they can continue to get business training and things like that and build up their CVs. But those classes are really expensive. They're like 1500 to 2000 bucks a month. And so they're not able to pay for them now because the classes are still being operated. They have to take the classes as part of their visa requirements, but their hours have been dramatically cut. So they're scrambling to try to pick up these extra hours. So that's been one of the other big major effects that I've seen. So anxiety, the beaches are now closed. Um, people are now actually taking seriously the isolation thing. The numbers are increasing. The hospitals are being overloaded. We can talk a bit more about that. I got a doctor friend that I've been hanging out with a bit. And, uh, and stuff like that. And she's kind of been giving me updates on, on what's going on with, um, the hospitals here. Um, I shared something on Twitter that she texted me about like ICU patients, um, suffering from COVID and shit like that. So it's starting to become, I think more, um, real for people here, you know? Yeah. I mean, not all that different what's going on here. You know, I live in the in the south here in the states and uh in a medium-sized city so it's not exactly rural or anything but it's more rural than you know where we grew up in the you know southern california and los angeles area um and people here there, there you know wasn't much public consciousness of what was happening i think it was more of a there was there's probably a, a pretty um um a pretty overwhelming sense of like this is going to pass over like sars did or ebola or whatever right um, yeah first. i think and i even, think yeah even amongst the academic crowd, it was kind of like a, well, you know, it's a news thing, right? Whatever. Um, mm. And then we went on spring break, so we were kind of all away from each other, and nothing seemed to change. People were still out doing everything they normally do out in public um, during that time. And then 
Um, over the last, you know, week and a half, two weeks, I think things have kind of, shit's kind of hit the fan. There's been more reported cases here um, in the city, even though there's no testing happening. Like, I, there's certainly no public testing centers that are out and about. I haven't seen any. Um, I think you'd probably have to hmm. basically be in the hospital at that point to, to get a test. Um, but then over the last few days, it's been pretty dead. Uh, people still walking about. You know, I walk the dog every day. Um, so you see people about and doing that, but there's very few cars in the road. Um, if you go to the grocery store, it's, it's pretty dead out there. So, um, it seems like there's been a bit of a change. It's probably not because people I think are, are taking it super seriously as much as just the fact that all the businesses are closed. Well, what are you going to do out there? Right. Um, hmm. are the cops imposing fines or has the, the state legislature or the, I, I don't, I know there's no national like lockdown order but is there any sort of like state lockdown or is there anything that's happened like that like in california for example yeah like so california has like the state lockdown and, and the you know the coastal cities are the ones obviously that are being hardest hit by this washington and new york and um, california so you're seeing them with the really aggressive measures right what was it gavin newsom referred to california as a nation state on yeah today the, the tongue. Yeah. <laughs> um i'm getting people's hopes up a little bit there uh, mm -hmm. the Republic of California. Um, <laughs> yeah, here, uh, nothing like that. There's There was a, a recommendation for lockdown, um, I think a week, week and a half ago or so. And then I think as of today, uh, I think yesterday the mayor announced that, that they're going to start imposing fines on people who aren't following through on those recommendations because I think there was a quite a number of social gatherings that were happening out in public and businesses mm -hmm. that weren't following through. Um, all the restaurants that we normally go to, though, were... Are all closed down and doing just takeout um, mm -hmm. delivery so uh, that's at least i mean but all the restaurants we go to are probably run by like 25 year old hippies with tattoos and people who look like you so um <laughs> no that's not saying much i have no idea if the local shonies or denny's uh were following the the quarantine recommendations um mm. yeah the but the public consciousness thing is i think the most interesting thing to, to think about here like we were talking before we started the um recording here that it's, it's difficult to know um, what to make of what the Trump administration is going to do about this. You know, like you yeah. think that if you know someone's um, a pathological liar, then you can kind of predict their actions based upon that. Right. That's kind of like the, the naive thought of how you deal with a, with a pathological liar. But the problem is you're never really sure with a pathological liar in which way they're lying. Right. That's the problem. If someone's telling the truth, then you at least know. If they, if they care about honesty, right, that, that's like a virtue of theirs or an honest person, you kind of can can bank on that, right, and act accordingly. But the liar, you can't just bank on the fact that they're lying because you don't know which lie they're telling. There's only one truth, right, but there are many lies. Hmm. Um, so, you know, yesterday or the day before, um, the White House came out and said that they're now projecting there to be between 100,000 and 250,000 deaths in the U.S. over the next, what, like six months or so or something like that. And so you're kind of wondering, like, well, that's a huge sea change from, you know, a month and a half ago. We had this thing covered. The it will, <laughs> the uh, the cases will soon be zero, and, and we got this thing handled, right? It's now 100,000 to 250,000 people will die. Um, that's not a very Trump-like thing, right, to sort of make this big announcement about how things are going to be dire. That's not, his, that's not his, like, playbook, right? But it could be two different things. It could be a sort of... Um, under promise over deliver thing, right? Which is like, yeah, get some blowback now from the media because he's changed his tune from it's not serious to now it's super serious, right? Um, and then over deliver by actually we're expecting it to be like 50,000. And so, you know, we're gonna uh, over deliver here and get um, get a pat on the back in the summer uh, heading into campaign season for uh, sort of uh, taking care of this thing, right? Um, yeah. or is it like, actually the numbers are, they're actually competent and the numbers are 500,000 to a million. And this is actually them tempering <laughs> down to not get criticism. Um, so mm -hmm. I don't know which of those it is. It's surely one of those, right? They're not telling the truth. Um, you wouldn't expect. Uh, so you don't know what to take from this. You don't, you can't look to the administration and be like, yeah, I have a signal here for, for how seriously they're taking it. And uh, what can I expect, um, to happen for the rest of this year? So you, you're kind of just in the dark, right? You kind of just can't look to them um, for any sort of uh, factual information or any sort of expectations about what the rest of your year is going to look like. Yeah, on the surface, it actually seems like a really clever political maneuver 
to under promise and over deliver say it's going to be a hundred thousand upwards to potentially a quarter of a million and then you stop it at like 40 to 50 thousand and you can come out looking like the fucking hero who halted the spread of this dangerous pandemic and then at the same time you can also say and i stopped war with iran I stopped war with North Korea. I've been able to handle all of these countries. And so you can continually kind of paint yourself in such a positive light. It's just these various different uh, bits of evidence that he can throw out to the electorate during the general campaign, right? Um, well, that plus, you know, what do Democrats do? Like, yeah, I exactly. send checks to everybody, right? Exactly. You got your Trump books. What do Democrats do with as Joe exactly. Biden's complaining about how we're going to pay for it um, with the deficit. Yeah. I was talking about, remember when when um, the Iranian general was assassinated, I was talking about how that was like his, Obama, or his uh, bin Laden moment that Obama had, right? Obama had that time where he went out and he killed bin Laden. And he could be like, yeah, I'm the guy that took out the most dangerous criminal in the world. And that's why dude, they were trying to dude, sell. Soleimani feels like seven years ago. <laughs> it does feel like that. I know. But it was so amazing, though, that they could use that, right? They could say – that's why they kept talking about how he was like the most dangerous terrorist in the world or something like that. They could use that language because that was his bin Laden moment so that he could have the same kind of thing that you know the guy that he's constantly measuring his penis against Obama had, right? Um, and so he's going to have more of these moments, right? Like – Everyone remembers how George Bush bungled Katrina. Well, if Trump can come out and be like, look at what I did with the pandemic, he can come out looking rosy because according to the memory of recent history where we're going to judge him according to all these other presidents, he can come out looking either equal to like because he had a similar moment or maybe a better moment. Um, and then he can kind of use that as leverage, whereas the Democrats have been fucking impotent because they are fucking impotent. Yeah, I mean, um, I have no idea if, if Trump and his uh, administration's competent enough to, to use all these maneuvers. We'll see. Um, but they're certainly there for the taking, right? Because Democrats are not going to own um, helping people <laughs> right now. Yeah. yeah. Unless no, the people true. included are their donors. Yeah, exactly. Retroactive exactly. Uh, tax breaks for their donors. That that they're going to be in the forefront. <laughs> yeah, but uh, for apparently sure. Pelosi didn't think that... Uh, Sending Dresh cash payments to people was a good idea. So that's out there. Yeah. Yay. 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 Vote blue no matter who. <laughs> Can you, is there any worse combination than election season in the United States involving Trump and Biden? And then also we're all on lockdown and can only talk about it over the internet? Uh, I know. Fuck. I mean, man. I mean, we're, we're joking about this, right? But this is a, I think it's kind of being underreported and underdiscussed because people are worried about how it will be taken rhetorically. But the mental health aspect of this yeah. lockdown is going to be one of the big stories that comes out of it. And this doesn't mean that we shouldn't be doing it. Just put that at the forefront, right? I don't. I'm at least not saying that the lockdown's a bad idea or the quarantine's a bad idea. Of course, it's what we need to be doing right now. But it's going to have effects on people's mental health it's going to have effect on people who are suffering from domestic abuse who are now imprisoned in their home right it's going to have effect on people who uh you know i'm super introverted you're not right you like feed off the energy of being around people it's going to affect uh, even in some small way people who um, need to have social interaction to sort of be motivated to do their work it's going to affect everybody to a small degree and many people to a large degree to the point where there's been discussion here i mean even in my small city um, there's been a spike in suicides over the past week and a half. Um, and that's going to increase, I imagine, as the lockdown increases in duration. And that's going to be one of the effects of this. And it's not going to be helpful that we're going into a political season um, that's bad for everybody, that, in, that in, involves basically nothing but bald-faced lying from all sides, right? Hmm. Um, and... It's going to suck. At the very best, it's going to suck unimaginably. <laughs> At the yeah. worst, it's going to involve a lot of people dying and suffering. Um, and I, it's unfortunate that we can't really talk about that and try and prepare for that without sounding like we're um, like conspiracy theorists or, you know, um, you know, someone who's saying that we should be out uh, saving the economy or whatever. Like you can you can hold both the fact that um considerations for individuals lives are more important than the economy um, and also hold that uh, rapid and sudden economic changes do have effects on individuals um, that are mm -hmm. that are bad and negative we don't want to have so 
Um, there's not a an obvious win-win uh, situation here. Yeah, so two things. The first thing is there's already been an uptick in reported domestic violence cases uh, reported from a couple of different countries. This was something that I was worried about, that I was talking with my family about and friends about weeks and weeks ago. And then when these cases came out, I was like, this is it, man. And my friends are like, fuck, man, you are right. I I just knew that was going to be the case. I come from a family that has experienced domestic abuse. People that are very close to me have experienced this. I don't know if I've talked about this on the podcast before explicitly, but I know we've we've glanced, we, we've like sideswiped it. Um, uh, but you know, uh, I have people that are close to me that have been in seriously abusive relationships. And all I could think about is I'm so glad that she is not in that situation anymore. And then I have friends, obviously, that have been in really bad domestic situations. And same thing, talking with a friend of mine recently who got out of a very abusive relationship um, about a year and a half ago. And all she's saying is, I am so glad that I am not trapped in a home with my daughter and this man anymore. And so I can't imagine what it's like to be someone who doesn't have that luxury not just in the sense of it's the same level of anxiety and fear and tension and abuse, but now it's just more constant. But then it's exacerbated exponentially, qualitatively, because now there are other layers of anxiety that are impinging upon both of them that are going to cause either a greater frequency or a greater intensity potentially of the abusive outbursts. So it's something that's very frightening to me, and it's something that I am worried about um, in the long term, what kind of effect that's going to have. Not to mention the other thing that you mentioned about people who already deal with anxiety and depression and who people like me who do need that human contact and people who are struggling and you just need touch. You need human touch. Like I, I, I'm, I'm a very kind of intimate, sensual person. I, I'm used to having touch. I have friends who are like that, you know? Um, and this is one of the things that they've been talking about, you know, is just how much they miss that or they will miss that kind of if we're forecasting this is supposed to last for months and months and months and months, right? Um, so that's one thing. And then the second thing is if that's the anxieties that we're talking about, I just think it's so fundamentally interesting that we talk about the economy because it seems to me, especially the way that the economy operates and the way that we view the economy oftentimes in terms of keeping things moving, right? Like think of a city. A city is basically from one perspective, a city is a conduit for the transportation of commodities, right? You in your body are a laborer and you get into your car every morning to sell your labor that is to sell your commodity to sell your labor so you get into your commodity your car that burns other commodities oil and gas and that wears and it's wear and tear on technology so that you can drive as quickly and as efficiently on a road that is also replete with commodities right the tar and the asphalt and things like that um, then it's also being financed by banks and um, there's property values and all these other elements of assets and commodities that are surrounding you that you're participating in as you kind of transfer through and move through this space so that you can go to your place of business that is in a building that is an asset that is a financial asset that has all kinds of commodities it's got all these inputs right the materials the building materials and the electricity and all this other shit and it's got all these other bodies that have all just gotten in their cars or in some sort of transportation system to get there. And then you go to this industry where you go to sell your labor so that you can produce more commodities or increase asset values or something along those lines. And so what you have then is this city is this huge system of the transfer and the accumulation of capital right or the tra the the the, tra uh, the the transfer of commodities and uh, asset processes for the purpose of capital accumulation i think it's probably a better way to phrase it and so then what you have then is you have this really strange system that is doing all of that but simultaneously is also telling you that this is good for you and that this is what the basis of society is and then i think even more nefariously this is what is our salvation this is the thing that covers over the anxieties that the system itself produces, which then creates more of a libidinal investment that induces you into a further frenetic attachment to the emotive and affective movement of this process while promising that it's going to alleviate your concerns and your sufferings and your anxieties. And so it promises this salvation. And I can't help but just be so struck with when that system slows down or it takes on a different form that there's also something about this salvation that has been promised that is lost 
right? And then the effects that it has. Because it's able to give you a modicum of pleasure. It does, right? Like you do feel good when you consume a piece of chocolate or when you go out and you get to go to the movie theater and you spend your, your Trump bucks or whatever it is that you're spending to go see a movie. Um, and, and when you do that, you do get pleasure. And so it does kind of create, and I'm not saying that it's bad that it's creating pleasure entirely. Um, you know, human societies operate in at least at one register by kind of creating pleasure in some ways. So I'm not saying that it's all bad in that sense, but the way that it does it is that it does it through kind of creating this dependency in itself, I think, an abusive way um, that makes you more dependent on the ex exploitative process or more dependent on the process's own furtherance. And then when that process slows down, then you lose your recourse for salvation, quote unquote, right? I'm using that kind of metaphorically, I guess, even though I'm not entirely, but it's kind of metaphorical. You lose the recourse to your modes or your your potential for seeking that pleasure and and for fulfilling those desires that you have and so then we turn to what what, what do we turn to like yeah you can sit at home and you can consume and you can watch movies and shit like that and you can work out and you can you know make tiktok videos and things and those might be some sort of supplement that that we can figure out how to get by but when we're cut off from each other when we're isolated from each other i think it really diminishes our capacity to actually even contemplate what it might mean to find new forms of salvation and in one sense it's 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 interesting because it kind of creates that break where we can pause and be like whoa fuck we have been so dependent on this system operating at a particular speed that maybe it can allow some of us to be like oh wow what's truly important here Maybe we can devise alternatives or simultaneously what it can do is it can cause us to feel an immense sense of guilt and a need to get back to that thing. And that's when it's abusive. That's when it's the abusive spouse that is beating you and then saying, but you need me. And then when you don't have them, all you want to do is just get that person to please you. And so you spend all your life subordinating yourself to that person's whims so that you can get just a little bit of pleasure from them or a little bit of affirmation or a little bit of attention or affection from them. And I feel like that's one of the other consequences potentially of what's happening here is we are just kind of being pushed down and pushed down and then we become more and more needy for the state capital nexus to give us the salvation that it always promises which then is just going to create a further kind of set of problems does that make sense dude yeah i mean um one thing i'm seeing a lot of from you know, people on the left on on twitter and whatnot is this hope and optimism that that the sort of disaster that follows from the pandemic will open people's eyes right and and let them see hey you know i've seen a lot of like um look who's really essential to society it's not uh hedge fund ceos and and shit like that it's like grocery store workers and nurses yeah. and doctors right um and then i'm kind of like yeah obviously i want that to be the case right i want people to see what's really important to society um and what's not and the fact that the um the rewards and punishments balances do not reflect what is actually important to society. But also, you know, it's also kind of an essential business right now, Netflix. Hmm. <laughs> so, um, and I don't think that's really important when it comes down to it, right? So I don't think we should just look at like what's happening as sort of revealing the truth to people about what's really hey, important. Hey, you know what else is really right? essential right now? The fucking oil industry is essential <laughs> right now to keep our lights on and to keep the internet, internet moving and things like that, right? Yeah, exactly. So let's not just look at this as like a truth revealing moment. Only, right. right. It could be that, but we have to do some work to show the truth that it's revealing. It's not just like the world all of a sudden is bearing its ass to us. Right. right. Um, I know, for instance, like uh, one thing I've been thinking about is uh, the utilitarians have a talking point right now. Um, and I don't want to like group them all together, but uh, mm -hmm. the it's been recognized that it's possible that more people have been saved by the lack of pollution in China right now mm -hmm. than will have died from the coronavirus. Um, so we actually might end up with more people's lives being saved by the coronavirus than killed, at least in China, uh, given the reduction in pollution. And so you look mm -hmm. at that and you're like, holy shit, man, like it's not clear at all. <laughs> Um, what's happening here so uh some real like work like philosophical and um political work needs to be done to talk about what exactly uh the coronavirus pandemic reveals about society and what uh needs to be done in the wake of it um which is important right because th i think there's kind of this hope that um I, I read an article on the atlantic yesterday that was like a reality has endorsed bernie sanders and it was a pretty <laughs> great headline the idea is basically like 
uh, Bernie Sanders' platform is basically the only one that takes the issues that we're currently facing seriously. Um, and that's uh, extremely manifested by the fact that uh, Joe Biden basically disappeared mm. over the past several weeks. Uh, he shows up like in Instagram live feeds with, you know, thumbs up emojis. Um, and then that's basically it, right? And part of that's because I think obviously he's not really capable uh, physically and mentally of, in, of engaging in like debate and um, talking about serious issues uh, in a way that's going to actually engage people, right? So even if he is doing like his podcast and his um, Twitter appearances and whatnot, it doesn't it doesn't go viral because he doesn't say anything that that matters at all. Um, hmm. uh, maybe he can't, but then also because it, there's nothing really for him to say, right? Um, Trump has a platform being the president, right? But he's not saying anything um, that's actually mattering ultimately. Biden just doesn't have either, so. Hmm. That's obviously, I agree with the fact that, you know, Bernie's the only one taking the issues that currently face us seriously, right? And he only, he's the only one in the platform that actually addresses those issues um, as if they're serious. But at the same time, that don't, that don't mean anything, right? Um, he's probably not going to be the nominee, right? Something isn't connecting, right? People aren't just looking at this disaster and being like, yes, now I realize that Medicare for all is needed, right? Now I realize that um, people shouldn't have to sell their labor in order to uh, get the the means for survival and stuff like that, right? So we need to like bridge that gap still. Um, uh, and that's that's not an easy task. And I don't know exactly what that means. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, I don't think we should just assume that um, that disasters and pandemics and uh, things like this just uh, like are the apocalypse in the, you know, Greek sense of like revealing the truth to everybody and everyone just gets on their knees and uh, pleads for forgiveness. It's not going to happen that way. Yeah, we were talking about this in the writer's room with uh, some of the Wisecrack writers, and uh, there's a guy named Leo who does a lot of writing. I think it was Leo. Leo or Miles? I, I think it was Leo. Leo um, was talking – yeah, it was Leo. Uh, Leo was talking about how – so sorry, Leo, if I if you're listening and I misattributed that. Um, but it was Leo, and he was talking about how it's like, isn't it crazy that we actually have a fucking apocalypse literally that we're living in right now, and yet people can't even think apocalyptically? Like, they can't think about the novel. They can't think about the other. And we were talking about a couple of video games. He was talking about The Last of Us and talking about this other game called Death Stranding, uh, um, which I've been playing. And um, I, I think both of us actually just, we talked about this, we finished The Last of Us. But he was like, it's so interesting that I don't want to spoiler the end of The Last of Us, but let's just say that the film, I'm sorry, that the video game, uh, he, as he was reading it, kind of primarily chooses a person's individual pursuits and redemption over the social cause, mm -hmm. primarily. And he was like, it's such a very interesting video game in that sense that even when we're talking about an apocalyptic event, it's still based on like liberal individualism. And I was talking about Death Stranding and the kind of theme of Death Stranding is to rebuild America. It's a post-apocalyptic world. The United States is gone and there's something called like the United Cities of America, but even that has been fractured and torn apart. And your mission is to help them re- claim america to rebuild america it's like you can't even get outside of your own like western liberal nationalistic ideals right like you have to go back and reclaim the thing that was lost you can't move forward and build something different and build new strands even though they're trying to kind of articulate that but it's still there's a conservatism there and it's really interesting that there seems to be like a stopgap that even in the midst of a literal apocalypse in the sense of like the way that the movies talk about it, it's impossible to actually be talking about a true kairos, a break in time, something that is qualitatively different or the apocalypse that you were talking about, the revealing, right? This kind of like revealing of novelty or excess that is beyond. It still is about trying to get back. And that's what I was talking about earlier with the economy as being like that salvation. It's still about getting back to the way things were. That's what everyone says, right? Like once things are back to normal, like if we can just reclaim the semblance of normalcy, even if there's like some difference, what is that difference going to be? Is that difference going to be some sort of like, I don't know, communist uh, equity that people are experiencing? Or is it going to be consolidation of uh, political power, consolidation of capital power, et cetera, et cetera? Um, that's basically a kind of more intensified surveillance platform, neo-feudal Amazonification, platformification, et cetera, et cetera, of the global economic order. Yeah, but we shouldn't downplay the fact that, I mean, look at the, um, the means for that latter option are readily available, right? Um, Viktor Orban in Hungary just suspended parliament. 
right? Mm. Like that mm. that's on the table um, when if mm. things you know if shit hits the fan. Uh, Amazon and um, what like some of the delivery services and stuff like that, they're going to be totally fine with this process. And there's a good chance that we don't have small businesses anymore in America in six months, right? Um, like 90% of them are all gone, right? So especially if they're not, um, uh, if, you know, major businesses are bailed out and small businesses are left in the dust or given like, you know, um, uh, access to loans and credit and that's it, right? So um, there's there's a strong sense that, yeah, we're the Amazon economy. This is the maybe the greatest thing that ever happened to Amazon, right? Where the um, monopolistic intentions of the, of the company become um, necessary, right? To make some sort of uh, economy survive throughout this process. So there's there's no guarantee things end up better than they were before after this. Disasters do not um, preclude uh, salvation, right? Yeah. Yeah, It's it makes me think too about a lot of the kind of ecological activists, environmental activists, climate activists who they hold out some sort of hope that like if we could just show people the crisis, then they'll wake up. I don't know, man. I mean, it seems to operate at too much of like a rational, reflective, and discursive level. And I, I just maybe it's because I read a shitload of psychoanalysis and Deleuze, and so I'm always thinking about the preconscious or the pre-subjective, the affective, and then the unconscious in the psychoanalytic sense. I just think that we're fundamentally irrational, you know. Um, and I just don't know that if you sit down with people and be like, well, now. If you really understand how serious coronavirus is, and if you really understand the effect this is going to have on you, I just don't think that people are going to be like, oh, you're right. You know, I guess I guess we should nationalize the oil industries and, and nationalize Amazon. And, you know, let's uh, let's, you know, create sovereign wealth funds and create equity stakes in all of our, our land holding and impose land value taxes. I just I can't imagine that the power structures are going to be like, yeah, you're right, guys. We do see the severity of these things now. It's, I don't, it's just not. It, it, it's not because they can't. They won't see it. They won't see it. But it's not because they won't see it. It's because they can't see it. Like I literally think they are fundamentally incapable. And I don't mean that as a as a rhetorical like snide remark. I mean that in the literal sense. Like it takes years of critical thought and self reflection. And patience and time and a certain way of viewing the world like in a hermeneutic sense it's your grid that has to be challenged and i think the grid by which they interpret the world will fundamentally prevent them from even being able to consider those alternatives because those alternatives to them just are either threats or they're just nonsense yeah the way you view the world is an important factor in this right if it's only rational and makes sense to assume that these measures are the solution to our problems if you have a fundamental sense um like a fundamental principled sense in which you think that people are ultimately equal and deserve uh equal consideration and uh, matter equally and um and all these things which are you know normative and ethical when it comes down to it and that's not shared necessarily by everybody um they may mm -hmm. you know sort of uh, put on glosses of those terms right but when you get down to brass tags that's not what they support um, and they think that inequality is important, and they think that that status of uh, one person over another is important to their identity. And so those measures aren't going to be the solution for them, right? Even if they see the same problems that everyone else sees, let alone the fact that we, you know, not everyone can even see the problems because of uh, mm -hmm. the like inability to access, um, you know, truth. So, um, yeah, I think there's there's fundamental issues here that have to be worked out, and we we can't just assume that it's going to be obvious to everyone um, that you know the left solutions are obviously the best ones. Uh, yeah. We may very well come out of this with um, uh, a much more authoritarian state uh, and a much more integration between the state and the economy in a way that's not uh, that's more authoritarian than it is like socialist or lefty, right? Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, there's been a slow, steady march. You know, you've got 9/11. You could create a narrative. You've got 9/11, which allows for the opening of rampant surveillance and then you have the dot-com boom at the same time that's taking place and then you have the uh, exponential expansion of information technology which allows for datafication and things like that which fits really well with the move towards surveillance right um so you've got datafication and surveillance that are not just political or biopolitical but that are also economic measures and then you have the financial collapse and you know the financial collapse has allowed for 
um, greater investment into these surveillance technologies and into these platform technologies and into datafication because now data becomes one of the things that can kind of prevent supposedly some of the problems of the economy if you know you just didn't have enough information to uh, be able to predict the uh, uh, the issues that are the undergirding problem uh, of of the GFC. Now with datafication, that becomes as some sort of a preventative measure. You know, we have now more information that we can use and we have uh, more efficient technologies that can allow us to mitigate some of those tensions that maybe otherwise would have happened in previous time periods, which leads someone like Janet Yellen, you know, the former chair of the Fed, to be like, yeah, we're in an age where we'll no longer have um, these financial crises, which was just totally naive, right? <laughs> but nevertheless, it leads her to be able to say something naive like that. And I think she meant it sincerely like she just thought that like fed policy was going to be able to foresee and mitigate and respond appropriately too big to fail we can always you know bail things out which is going to give investors confidence so that you'll never have these types of shocks and things like that and then simultaneously if we really do need to kind of like prime the pumps we can do that too which is just obviously proven to not be the case and so you have like this steady march towards datafication intensification of technology um, consolidation of power, a shift towards assetization, the asset economy, digital technology, things like that. And I think that this is only going to be exacerbated after this, especially as you have in the States people talking about the digital ID, um, now digital currencies, you know, uh, nations are talking about digital currencies. Um, you've got people now that are more and more dependent on their social joys coming from being online it's just been a steady march anyway but then with this you're forced into it and i don't think it's going to be the kind of thing when people are like what are you going to do once this is over it's not like it's not like a football game where you're trapped inside of a stadium and it's like what's the first thing you're going to do when you get out of that or like a movie theater you're going to stretch your legs and adjust your eyes and all of a sudden you're going to be living in a different world no it's not something that's so like start and stop it's i don't know if there is a quote unquote after coronavirus like it will. We need to think in a Hegelian sense about how there will be a synthetic perpetuation, a, a type of assumption of this into the next synthetic stage of history that is going to forever be with us. So I don't know that there's ever going to be an after, as though the event stops and now you're in a new, you turn the page in a new chapter or something like that. And so I, I just, I worry what this means, I think, in the long term in terms of like how this is going to further integrate all of these technological um, data um, surveillance uh, too big to fail um, uh, Hyman Minsky calls it the age of big bank big government type of stuff right and I just think that that is only going to be intensified as we move forward and you know we know you were talking earlier about the fact that you know uh, people are fundamentally irrational in a certain way and um, you know we know psychologically that people react uh, to fear with uh, conservative um, uh, beliefs and actions, right? So like you can you can prime someone with um, a, a mood of an emotion of fear, and then their beliefs and their uh, actions will become more conservative over time yeah. uh, in the short term. And so we know that that that's the thing you should expect to happen when people are afraid, right? Like I know a lot of people on the left are really perplexed at the idea that Trump's approval rating for how he's handling the pandemic is like 60% positive, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, which is bewildering to think about, right? Given that there's so much evidence, both that it's been bungled and also literally that he has been wrong about everything. <laughs> like, <laughs> right. it's, you can't just forget that a month and a half ago, two months ago, he was saying this wasn't a big deal. Like, you don't just forget that, right? So, um, but those things don't matter, right? Uh, what matters is, it seems, I mean, I would think that it's not bearable to think that the person who is the most important and powerful person in the world has no fucking idea what he's doing um and in the midst of a pandemic like that's just an unbearable thing for a lot of people so it's sort of like a an aspirational approval <laughs> right like mm. please god do something that uh, uh will benefit us and that and then and show that you can uh, are competent enough to handle the situation and um that's important right like that's that's how people react to these things. And um, I don't think that the answer to that is people are literally fundamentally irrational. And so they need to be like, um, you know, uh, shepherded um, in some like controlling authoritarian, uh, authoritarian manner. Um, that's not the answer. But neither is the answer that if we just like lay the facts out, it will be obvious what we should do. Um, mm -hmm. That's going back to like that uh, 
uh, I keep going back to it, the G.A. Cohen's, um, what's his metaphor for the, the Marxist reading? The um, obstetric. The, birth, the obstetric metaphor, yeah, the, the, the birth-related metaphor. If we can just birth out the baby of, of facts and truth, then it will be obvious for everyone um, <laughs> that the uh, socialist alternative is the only one. Um, that's certainly not true. Like, the, the case has to be made for that. And it's not been made. Like, I don't know if we're going to do some, like, retrospective on the Sanders campaign. I guess it's not technically dead yet, but um, it's in its death throes, right? Uh, it's some, I think there's some, not necessarily blame to go around, but some learning to be done, right? About how this whole thing went. Like, um, I know I was very cautiously optimistic a few months ago that, that Bernie might get the nomination. And I think I, yeah. I hedged it quite a bit in saying that this could all end tomorrow if Obama comes out and, uh, swings his big dick, right? Which I think he did, honestly. Uh, he didn't do it in public, but he did it in private. Mm -hmm. Um, at the very least, something functionally equivalent to Obama doing that happened because everybody got in line fucking real quick <laughs> behind mm -hmm. the uh, uh, the centrist uh, uh, nominee, um, which effectively ended Sanders' campaign. But I think also um, there's been some mistakes made uh, by the campaign and how they're addressing the situation. As much as I am ideologically more aligned with with Sanders than any politician in you know my lifetime, obviously by leaps and bounds, there's some learning to be done about um, how to make the case for these things. It seems like Sanders is going to do worse uh, possibly than he did in 2016, um, which may, may make us reflect on the fact that his success in 2016 may have a lot more to do with hatred for Hillary than it had to do with mm. love for Sanders' campaign, uh, which is not necessarily the worst thing in the world. Like It could uh, just be that the growth of these ideas is, um, is positive, but not quite as revolutionary as we maybe had hoped in 2016 right yeah uh, i mean maybe least, we just, it means there's more we, work to be done yeah and we just maybe need to start realizing that americans are we like to think that like ah the demographics show that like i mean and yes young people do overwhelmingly support you know bernie sanders but the way that it comes across i think from some people is that like if only the old people would get out of the way then socialism would take hold right or like yeah, that's just totally wrong-headed yeah, I just I th maybe there's a sense in which and this doesn't this doesn't really kind of like overturn the demographic argument, but maybe there's still a sense. So it's kind of a separate argument, but maybe there's a sense in which we need to just come to grips with the fact that like the United States of America is fundamentally extremely conservative relative to other places around the world. Right. So uh, we had Tom Airy on our podcast right? Um, for people who don't know, Tom was my old basketball coach in high school. And now he's kind of like a, like, how would you describe him? Like a, a post evangelical? Is that about right? Yeah, that sounds right. Um, and so he was talking, he recently posted something on Facebook that I thought was really fascinating. Um, so he was a part of a group called fellowship of Christian athletes. Do you, do you remember what that was? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So he was a part of that a long time ago, and this is his post from Facebook. So a couple decades ago, I met Ralph Drollinger. Do you know Ralph Drollinger, Troy? Um, from the church? No, Back in the just day? the former basketball player, NBA player. Oh, um, I don't think so. Maybe Ralph Drollinger. Drollinger. It's Drollinger. kind of ringing a bell. Yeah, so he said, I have, a couple decades ago, I met Ralph Drollinger at a Fellowship of Christian Athletes event. Like me, he grew up playing basketball in Southern California. Unlike me, he's seven foot two and played in the NBA. Now, Drollinger leads the White House Bible study. Ten cabinet members attend. Last week, he wrote a biblically astute evaluation, quote, that's his words, Drollinger's words. Last week, he wrote this, claiming that COVID-19 is a form of God's wrath punishing the world for China's, quote, recklessness and lack of candor and transparency. He also blames gays, lesbians, and environmentalists. And then he goes on <laughs> and to criticize, obviously, because Tom agree disagrees with that fucking vehemently, right? Basically saying that this guy's the problem. But this is the guy that's leading the White House Bible study. And this type of mentality is extremely common in the United States. My father actually sent me a audio file of our former pastor, John MacArthur, who gave a message addressing this time um, called like trusting God in a troubling age or something along those lines. And I've also done just a little bit of digging about all of these pastors who are leading their congregations through these COVID-inspired 
apocalypse-inspired messages about how God is in charge and we just need to trust and that Trump is like Cyrus and all of this shit. It's a very similar narrative. I mean, it's not surprising if you have the upbringing that we had. But it's just so interesting because this is a sociological study that I think if you're from Australia or if you're from the UK, I don't think you understand this. Like, the depth of a certain type of religious mystification which relates to a type of conservatism is so deep in the United States that we can't also neglect that as being another huge contributing factor for how it is that we respond to these types of events and why it is that somebody like Trump has a 60% approval rating. You know, that contributes greatly to that. Now, I'm not saying that 60% of America is that fundamentally evangelical. That's not the point. The point is that's a huge contributing input that oftentimes flies under the radar when you think about like political think pieces and kind of the more secular media that's trying to wrap its head around these things. Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly agree with that. I think that that's um, both an important issue and not uh, like the major issue overall. I think it's a, it's a, it's a um, decreasing number of people who are kind of involved um, in that form of thinking, although it's, you know, a, a, a group of disproportionate power um, in politics and in culture, uh, given how small they are. I mean, what's Trump's, you know, um, base is like, what, 30, 35 percent? of the country, you know, the group that yeah. will not possibly um, betray him lest he hmm. uh, like literally do abortions on TV. Um, right. But that 30% that be- doesn't exist in the UK, right? It's like 10%. And like in Australia, it's like 5%. It's Hillsong Church right. and that's it. <laughs> you but know? even that 30% is not just evangelicals, right? It's also just really dedicated Republicans who will just mm. um, live or die by the party, right? Mm. Um which, of course, Democrats have that, too. So it's not unique to Republicans. Um, to have that. There's a certain base that will not uh, betray the Democratic Party no matter what. Uh, you know, their party over everything else. Um, so, yeah, I think it's an important issue um, and one that has to be dealt with. I mean, and not even dealt with. Like, there's, there's almost one sense in which it's just there's nothing you can do for those people, <laughs> right? Um, yeah. Unless you have a personal relationship with them and might be able to uh, be like, you know, their Apostle Paul. Right. Um, <laughs> then there's, there's not much that can be done uh, at the uh, at the uh, grand level. It's only the granular level that can be affected, effective for those people. But at the same time, I don't I don't think we should just say um, the country is fundamentally and I know you're not saying this, but like there's there's this, this thought out there that the, this fatalism that the country is fundamentally conservative. There's nothing you can do. Um, and so you have to just work extra politically or something, whatever that ends up meeting. Um, to affect uh, radical change. And certainly I think we should be working extra politically as well as politically to do this. But um, I do think that like probably one of the, if not the greatest hope for the country is to have someone like a Sanders who becomes president. And that doesn't mean all your problems are solved when that happens, but it's uh, I think it would be a huge change to the symbolic consciousness of the country. Um, and that probably isn't going to happen now. And that's, I think, a really sad state for the country. And I don't know what it means that um, Biden will very likely be uh, the nominee here. If, you know, some chicanery doesn't happen and Andrew Cuomo or Clinton or somebody else takes things uh, by surprise at the convention in July, if they even have a convention. Um, I do think it's important to note that um, Biden isn't the nominee because people believe in him, right? Mm. It's not that like the country is fundamentally conservative, and so most Democrats want the conservative candidate. They don't. Most Democrats favor Medicare for all. Most Democrats think that their um, that their political beliefs are more aligned with Sanders than anybody else uh, who leads the party. Right. Uh, all the polling showed that people think Sanders is the nominee who best represents their ideas, and who most understands their plight and what they care about. But they don't think he can win. And the reason that they think that um, comes from the, Demo- the Democratic Party leadership and the media. That's who's been telling them for the past several years that Sanders is too radical and he can't beat Trump. And the number one issue for Democrats is beating Trump. That's more important than everything else. It's more important than health care. It's more important than climate change. It's more important than anything else, right? So it's rational for, I think, for people who consider themselves either on the left or on the center left or in some sense liberal um, and it's a huge swath of people, right, that don't share everything in common. But of that, you know, really large group of that big tent, the belief is 
we support Biden for um, instrumental reasons, right? Because we think he's the only person who can really beat Trump. Um, and that gets into a much bigger issue that isn't really about people being fundamentally conservative than it is about how um, power is structured within all the institutions that make up the left and uh, liberalism and like, you know, you know, um, liberalism in the sense of, you know, uh, the political spectrum of the United States right now, from the media to the Democratic Party to whatever other, you know, minor institutions that make up it as well, um, way down to podcasts, right? Yeah. And that, I think, is the most fundamental issue. Why do people think that Biden's the only person who can beat Trump? When I'm not saying that Sanders is the only person who can. I'm saying we don't know. <laughs> That's the exact same thing Republicans said about Trump in 2016, is that he's the only, um, he can't beat Hillary, we need somebody who's more of a mainstream Republican uh, to sort of take that plunge because Trump will get, you know, uh, trounced. And they were wrong about that. They could have been right. They were very close to being right about that. Um, but they ended up being wrong. It might be that Sanders can't be Trump. Maybe he is too radical. Maybe people will scoff at the you know socialist label that got thrown around. It's also very likely that Biden gets trounced because, um, I don't know if you saw this uh, article the other day, but... 25% of Biden voters are enthusiastic about um, his chances, right? Or enthusiastic about him as a candidate, right? Not about his chances of winning. And that's the lowest number in recorded history for a Democratic nominee. Wow. And every single nominee who has had, I don't remember the number, it was something like under 45 or under 50% has lost. And the ones who have gotten um, enthusiasm that was up in the like 50s and 60s have always won. So it's a really good marker for how your chances of success in the general election, how enthusiastic your voters are in the primary, right? Hmm. And his are historically low, right? Hmm. Um, that might end up meaning nothing because maybe this is a unique election um, coming this year. Who knows, right? I'm not saying this means Biden's going to lose. But there's just as much evidence and just as many markers and signals that he's going to get trounced as that he's the only person who can beat Trump. So we don't really know the answer to that. And this is a much bigger issue than just the fundamental <coughs> liberal or conservative bent of the populace. This is about how power works in all these institutions that make up um, the political process in the country. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, here's the thing. I keep hearing all of this from kind of like more left-leaning political commentators. And I'm not saying it's wrong, but it just it's like the same discourse that I keep hearing. And so I'm kind of curious. Like, I'm like, there's got to be something else that we're missing. And so that's why I'm thinking about maybe there's something else, that there is just this fundamental rejection, actually, of Sanders. Not just simply that he can't win, but that there's maybe maybe we do need to reconcile with the fact that there's also a large contingent that does, does fundamentally reject it because of, you know, red baiting or whatever it is, right? Or there's a conservatism. You know, I'm sure there are some that are that way for sure that we can talk about. Like I know people in my family, for example, that they might like him and his authenticity, but they're just scared of the S word. So I, I'm just trying to think about something outside of it. And when you were talking, I thought it was so interesting the way that you were diagnosing why it is that people were, were choosing Biden as somebody who they think can win more. And it reminded me of... Um, something in the logic of uh, of speculation. Are you familiar with Keynes's beauty theory, uh, beauty pageant? Yeah, yeah. So, for people who don't know, uh, in like the 1920s and shit, in newspapers, they would have these beauty pageants where there would be all these women, right? And you would vote on who you thought was the most beautiful. And Keynes has this diagnosis that he then thinks applies to financial speculation, which is that people don't vote for the person that they personally just objectively. Mm -hmm in their own position think is the most beautiful but they're anticipating what other people think and they're voting based on what other people think uh is beautiful or who the, the the person is that they think is beautiful and that's what influences or affects their vote so there's like this anticipatory speculative move that's taking place which fits really well i think into also like Rene Girard and mimetic desire and all these other uh, other things. You, know, you can even talk about Lacanian psychoanalysis, desires, the de desire of the other kind of stuff, right? Um, but I think there's something really interesting here that maybe we could apply to why it is that people are voting. It's not because they individually are firmly rooted in this idea that Biden can beat Trump or even that Bernie can't beat Trump. But there's this anticipation that the other person, like maybe I think that Bernie can beat Trump, but the other person doesn't. And because I know that the other person doesn't, that that affects, if you will, how it is that they cast their vote. 
And it reminds me again of that Zizek thing where he talks about the toilet paper crisis, where I think it was like in like fucking Hungary or Czech Republic or something like that, where there's like a, a shortage in toilet paper. And we could also apply it to now with uh, the shortage on toilet paper. And Zizek basically, it's like this old joke where it's basically like, I am not stupid. And I very well know that the store will not run out of toilet paper. Like, I'm fine. But I also know that everybody else is stupid and they won't get that and they're going to panic buy. So in order to beat them to it, I better buy all the toilet paper. Right? And there's something interesting about this, like, speculative, anticipatory, mimetic type of logic that I think might also need to, to be considered to help us understand what's going on, you know? Yeah, I think that's really astute, right? And because this is an important difference, I think, between what's happened over the past 10 years with the two parties, right? And they're big tents, right? So we shouldn't just uh, reduce them to two groups as if the country can be reduced to Democrats and Republicans. But there's one important respect in which that's a marker, right? And Republicans rejected the idea that they shouldn't vote their conscience, right? <laughs> and their and their their conscience for a lot of them was just, I think Trump is awesome. <laughs> I don't give a shit that I'm told by everyone else that he's not and that he's a pariah, right? And a lot of Republicans obviously voted for Trump because they, they're just, you know, Republican diehards. They don't actually support him personally, right? But he only won because his really strong base who honestly ideologically aligns with him and cares about him as, um, as a, being their president, right? Mm -hmm. Um went against sort of the social injunction uh, against Trump. And Democrats are so incredibly, especially like the, the sort of power center of the party, right? Um, the lobbyists and the, uh, and the various politicians and the, um, and, and the various sort of power brokers and donors in the party. Um, they're so aligned with this, like we're not allowed to care about things and to have like a candidate that, that we follow for conscience reasons, right? That we actually uh, think would be the best candidate. You're not allowed to, to say that or to think that. You have to be professional. You have to be objective. You have to be like a scientist, right? Um, mm -hmm. And totally dispassionate about the issue and think about what's best overall, which of course is never really discussed. Like how do you, how do you, what's the standard of evaluation for what's best overall? That's never really brought up, right? It's just obviously like some utilitarian notion of like, um, you know, greatest amount of welfare or increase in GDP or whatever it is, right? Um, and so it's, almost, it's considered naive and even like sinful to mm. vote your conscience and to, and to actually care about a candidate because you align with them politically. Have you noticed like, um, what's the name of uh, Bernie's, um, it's like his, it, not his press secretary, but like his cam, one of his oh, campaigns. His comms, his comms director? Is it Brianna? Yeah, Bri Brianna Joy is or it? something, Brianna Joy Gray or something like that. Yeah, something like um, that, yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't follow her on Twitter, but she pops up all the time because she's a, yeah. a comms uh, advisor Same. or whatever it is. And she recently, what was it? Uh, she criticized on Twitter Kamala, Kamala Harris yeah. for saying that uh, coronavirus treatment should be free, but then not obviously extending that to a free treatment for anything, including like um, you're getting cancer. And if you're poor and get cancer, then that's not going to be included in that. And of course, it's a long history there, right? Because Kamala Harris did support Medicare for all as recently as like what six months ago <laughs> and mm -hmm. then uh backtracked on an issue when she decided she wanted to be a centrist and run in that lane um so and and part of the criticism there was like what are you doing caring about things this is not good for your political future that was a major criticism and it's just like where have we gone that we can't even talk about like really truly issues of value like what we care about and what matters <laughs> in politics rather than just like um like these kind of like faux strategic discussions, which aren't even really strategic, right? Because they're just like guessing and speculation that's not based upon any real evidence when it comes down to it, just sort of assumptions about what's evidence, like the mm. beauty pageant idea you're talking about, right? Yeah. Do we really know what other people are going to think? We don't, right? Because we're kind of assuming they're, vo they're voting based upon their conscience, what they really believe. But then they're not doing that either, right? So there's like layers and levels here that we're never going to really unearth when you're doing that sort of like pure strategy, 11 dimensional chess type of thing. Right. <laughs> and it really goes off in haywire, right? The democracy really in the limited sense of like voting um, for your best interests. And then that's going to work in the aggregate to come up with everyone's best interests or whatever you think like the, the naive version of like the democratic institution is and what its goals are. Is not going to work if no one's actually voting their conscience, but has some like eleven-dimensional chess speculation about what's um, going to happen in the end. Um, and I think it's really important that we get back to this kind of naive notion of thinking about what matters and what's of value um, in uh, politics, what we actually want in the end. 
and then try and figure out how to best achieve that rather than doing this crazy Rube Goldberg machine that we're doing. Like, there's a reason why Democrats are sort of totally alienated from their party and from each other and have a lot of infighting, right? It's not just because of the big tent, right? And there's a lot more to it um, than that that's causing this. It hasn't always been this way for the party, I think. It's obviously a, a unique and new thing. I mean, to tie this back into the coronavirus pandemic, do you think that this is also manifesting itself in the ways that the various parties are dealing with this issue, in the ways that the system itself is established so that it's even able to operate in response to this issue? And and what I mean is, like, is there like an instrumental logic, a consequentialist logic, a utilitarian logic? Is there something that uh, we not to just overly reduce it to a single type of abstract theoretical framework that is somehow like the a priori paradigm that is guiding all thought and action? But is there a sense in which we can start to do that kind of work that ties into these other tendencies that we're discussing? I mean, it's got to be right. Like, we're going to see this over the next six months um, in preparation for the election. How does Biden and the rest of you know his surrogates, how do they deal with addressing the, the clearly the, the what's going to be the major issue in the election, which is this coronavirus stuff, right? Which they were not prepared for it to be the major hmm. um, discussion topic, obviously, right? I thought it was going to be like the economy or – I mean, I don't even know if Biden would make it. Like, I guess um, – what do we even would Biden, Biden's big talking point against Trumpy? I don't even know what it would be. Like uh, you're a jerk, <laughs> or something, right? He can't talk about healthcare. He can't talk about um, like kids in cages, given the fact that Trump will just throw back at them that you started the camps. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I don't even know what. Who knows if they'd even debate, right? They might not even debate when it comes down to it. Um, but uh, it's not going to be any of that now. It's going to be coronavirus stuff and pandemic stuff and all that. And I don't know what the Democratic Party's line's going to be. Like their line can't be that we're the ones who helped people because there's evidence that they opposed that you know certain elements of the party opposed the checks at first, right? And it was actually Republicans who came out. It was Romney who came out first and publicly said this is the thing we need to do, right? And Trump's going to be able to own that. Um, I guess if it really gets bungled, you know, over a hundred thousand people die, then that's going to be obviously the main talking point, right? But what what are Democrats really going to be able to say about what they did? And what they can do differently. And I don't know the answer to that. And whatever it is, whatever their talking points are going to be, is going to be evidence of um, what they think uh, is of real value. And that's uh, not even what they think is real value, what they think everyone else is going to think is a real value. Because they're doing this crazy beauty pageant speculation shit, right? Hmm. Uh, which never actually works in the end. Um, the whole, uh, for every uh a leftist that we alienate we're getting two republicans in the suburbs bullshit which uh <laughs> was pure speculation and obviously incorrect back in 2016 um and it's i i'm i'm really sad honestly about the fact that at the very least bernie brought back this notion of we can actually care about things hmm. we can actually value things and it's not ridiculous and naive and stupid to care about things politically and luckily i think it's still there that feeling and that mood is still there amongst um, especially young people, but anybody, I think, who supported Sanders and probably a lot of people who supported Warren, too. Um, and what the, where that energy is going to go, I think, is going to be the big story of the future for the left. Mm -hmm. Because it's got to go somewhere because people aren't just going to give up on that shit. Uh, but it's probably not going to be for Bernie anymore. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's it's kind of shifting tack a little bit, but it's I've just been thinking a lot about you know, we talk about this a lot on the podcast, but thinking about what kind of society we want to live in, you know, and um, I mentioned this briefly before we started recording, but there was an article that recently got written about how um, people with Down syndrome or that are on the uh, lower functioning scale of autism um, or that have other forms of um, of uh, of, of like disability of, of psychological or physical disability that they would be restricted access to some of the uh, cures like ventilators and hospital beds and things like that for curing coronavirus and I was on a, uh, a chat with a friend the other day she's the a student doctor um, I think I mentioned her earlier in the podcast. I can't even remember. My the time doesn't exist to me anymore so I don't remember when I said this <laughs> but I was chatting with her the other day about the issue of bioethics and she was talking about how difficult this is and she's like 
And then at the same time, I mean, we basically came to the conclusion that this is just an impossible situation. But at the same time, what do you do if you have 100 ventilators and you have uh, 1,200 people? You know, how do you make those difficult decisions? And the problem is, is, you know, she was giving me some insight into how it is that the hospital operates. And the hospital operates, the people who run the hospital, they tend to operate, you know, based on just numbers. You know, human beings are just inputs into their spreadsheets, right? And um, then you obviously hear these stories about how in Italy, how they're basically choosing who gets to live and who gets to die, right? And oftentimes it's people over 80 that are refused the medical services. And then it's the younger people who are considered the viable people who get the services, right? And, um, or the people that they believe that they have a higher chance of being able to, to benefit with, you know, putting them on a ventilator or giving them a hospital bed or whatever. <clears throat> and so I was just thinking, I was like, can we even operate in our society? Like, can you operate a healthcare system like we have, even if it were a nationalized one, a single payer system, you know, think of the UK's or Canada's or something like that. Can you even fully operate one of those healthcare systems so large that's trying to prevent death and prevent disease and prevent suffering on as great a scale as possible? Can you do that with also maintaining some level of a concern primarily for the good or like building a good society? Or is there almost a sense in which you're like hamstrung into a type of instrumentality, almost a type of utilitarian calculus, you know? Like how yeah, could you have it's... how could you have a huge global medical system based on modern technology and modern efficiencies and the surgeries that we have and the cures that we have and try to get people in as quickly as possible? Not even forgetting for a second, like let's even be a little bit more utopic and forget for a second the profit motive, right? Could you even have that and have it operate just in terms of having the capacity to be able to service people and have it operate according to the good or like is it does it just have to be instrumental <laughs> you know and functionalist almost yeah and that's a super important question and it gets to the heart of the you know one of my hobby horses about um, these moral dilemmas and is that uh moral dilemmas always try and force you into a narrow scope um, about the issue, like do I do I save the eight-year-old person or the forty-five-year-old person, right? And obviously, um, when you're in the dilemma itself, it has the narrow scope, right? In a lot of ways, um, but then it's really important, I think, especially when you're being dispassionate and trying to be objective, to to do that not by not considering the humanity of the person, because the humanity of the person is an objective feature of them. It's not a a, a purely a passion-fueled one of the of them or a subjective one. Um, but to also look at the wide scope of the issue, right? It didn't, ha almost every moral dilemma didn't have to be that way, right? Mm. There are some, you know, that are not like that, but most of them didn't have to be that way. Um, we didn't have to have a healthcare system that wasn't prepared for a pandemic, right? But we do. We didn't have to bungle the response to it. We didn't have to um, not use the Defense Production Act to immediately begin making ventilators and masks two and a half months ago when we knew this was gonna be the case. Yeah. So we didn't have to have 90% really of our medical supplies, you know, be reliant upon import from China. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, these things didn't have to be that way. And that doesn't help you in the immediate scenario. Right. But I think it does help you think about the moral dimensions of it, which is uh, that it matters now. That means it will matter in the future. Mm -hmm. And so our responsibility in the wake of that is just, it's going to be wider in scope than just what do I do in this instance? You know, if you're the doctor, this this kind of philosophical musing is not going to help you, right? When you're in the midst of it and you're deciding right. who lives and who dies, right? Um, which, of course, you're not really deciding anyway. It's an ethics board or whatever at the hospital that's doing it. And you, maybe they end up having to follow utilitarian logic. And that's not entirely wrong. Like there's Utilitarianism is, is an extremely narrow moral theory. And it gets some things right in that extremely narrow moral theory, right? Um, it's, it's the wider aspect that it completely misses. Uh, mm. And I think that that just means we need to do that. Uh, address that wider aspect and think about how our responsibility isn't just to figure out what to do in this moment, but what to do to, to take responsibility for the fact that this dilemma occurred in the first place and didn't have to. And that's ultimately, I think, even the more important um, thing to think about when it comes to our responsibility in the wake of these things is to figure out what we need to do to make sure these things don't um, end up occurring in the first place. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I know. I mean, 
we've been going a little while here. Is there anything you wanted to kind of address? I have a feeling this is going to come up again. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, how would it not, right? Like, uh, we've know. been holding in all this stuff for the last month. <laughs> I know. Um, I mean, is there anything at, a, like, a more personal level? I mean, we talked a little bit about domestic abuse and, and psychological issues and things like that. But is there anything at the more, like, individual, personal, social level, like, that you want to talk about that we could address real quick as a kind of final, a final note? Or do you want to kind of maybe put a button on it and then do it again next episode? Yeah, maybe we'll put a button on it. I do think there's just really briefly, like, you know, people talk a lot about how um, individuals uh, are fundamentally selfish and only care about themselves. And we know that people aren't that way, uh, even generally. I think that there's a strong sense in which living under sort of late capitalism stunts people such that mm -hmm. they become more selfish than they would otherwise be. I mean, human nature is not fixed. It changes given, you know, social conditions and environmental conditions and nurture and everything else right um and even with all of those things working against it i think people are not inherently morally um are not inherently selfish they're they're selfish but they're not just only selfish right mm. so it's much more complex than that and we see the the evidence that people are I and mean, we even know this like sociologically right that um, when disasters strike people actually become uh have more solidarity with each other um than they did before in a lot of cases and uh, that doesn't mean that we're fundamentally like altruistic either, right? Right. And it's right. neither. We're both. <laughs> um, and different conditions will bring out one or the other. And I think that's mm. important to realize. And that also tells you that there's like that that tells you that there's work to be done, right? That that gives you um, the like practical syllogism for what you need to do, which is to try to help uh, make people more altruistic uh, and more concerned with um, uh, what's ultimately good, and not just uh, with their own like personal self interest. And so we're going to see, I think, in the next six months, a lot about uh, a lot of evidence that we can take about um, the state of American culture, as well as the state of American politics. But I think we all kind of know how fucked up that is, right? <laughs> but American mm -hmm. culture is maybe more uh, uh, opaque, and maybe we'll get a clearer view of that in the next six months. So I'm very interested to see what that looks like looking back on it um, after all this, probably more so than we've gotten in a six-month uh, period and uh, in, in isolation before, right? Hmm. Given the the sudden changes to everything. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Because I am I am worried about the societal impact that this is going to have. Um, you know, I do I do worry about not just the stuff that we talked about before that seems more like top down and authoritarian, like surveillance problems and um, uh, consolidation of of capital power and things like that. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm worried about that, but. I'm also worried about like the fragmentation and the um, decentralizing effects that this is going to have um, on people. Yeah. And it might sound strange to speak about consolidation in one breath and then simultaneously to talk about fragmentation in, in, at the same time, but I don't think that they're actually mutually opposed, and I think they reinforce one another. There's a sense in which if you can fragment people socially, if you can create a type of frenetic chaos... And then simultaneously, you can come along with the cure and you can say, ah, but as long as you become uh, a better participant, a better citizen, a more obedient citizen, as long as you bear the burden of this psychopolitical regime, um, then you can kind of mitigate the uncertainties or the anxieties that come from this fragmentation, which is just a problem of nature or some shit like that, right? That, that can be kind of sold to people. And so this is where I do worry. It's it's Byung-Chul Han talks about this actually in his book Psychopolitics, and how there's a sense in which the media can contribute to this type, uh, can kind of exacerbate this type of fragmenting, and um, that uh, that that political propaganda can can lead to that by causing fear and anxieties and and whatnot. And I do. That's one of the things that I'm fundamentally concerned about is the kind of like psychopolitical effects that lockdown that um that that the constant media attention on this pandemic is having and the shared there's like a mimetic and shared anxiety right it's not just a sharing of information but there's an affective and libidinal sharing that's taking place it's a um it's i don't even know what you would call it but it's a type of like parapsychological experience where everybody is participating 
in this same anxiety and we're sharing it with one another. Not intentionally, not because we're like sadists or anything like that. And it's not just simply because we're all in this together either. There's something that is contingent and constructed about it as well. And that's the thing that I worry about. How long is that going to last? To what extent is that going to affect people and then actually constitute new forms of subjectivity or new new domains of subjectivity? Because I think subjectivity is always being constituted. So there are new layers, we might say, that are being added to the seven-dip layer that is the human subject, right? Um, and new dimensions and and new forms of, of response and things like that. And that's what I really worry about here because I'm seeing it in my own self. Like it's not even so much the content of what I'm thinking, but it's the disposition. It's the affect. It's the emotion. It's, um, it's the sense that I have when I'm talking with people. It's the fear that I'm, that's being relayed to me from my friends. Literally every single person I talk with talks about how they're anxious right? There's an anxiety. There's a fear. So many people are far from home. They can't talk with their family. Um, I just saw somebody today. It was kind of lovely, but also terrifying and sad at the same time. Uh, it was a younger woman. She's in her 30s, but she was singing happy birthday to her grandma from a social distance from like 20 feet away because she doesn't want to get close to her like 70 something, 80 something, whatever she is, year old grandma, because she doesn't want to get her grandma sick. And I'm like, well, in one sense, it's beautiful because you should have seen the joy on her grandmother's face that she was still getting celebrated. But also at the same time, it's fucking horrifying that like, what if this lasts for months and months and months and months and months? Or what if it's like, like you were talking about before we started recording, recording a seasonal norm that we're just going to have to deal with uh, every year. We just go into fucking lockdown or there's rolling lockdowns. Like I think you talked about that California was talking about doing, you know, a few weeks on a few weeks off or whatever the fuck it is. Like, yeah. I just really worry about the psychopolitical and the psychosocial aspect of this whole pandemic and then the response to this pandemic and that's the thing that i think is relatively unquantifiable which means it's something that is outside the the capacities of measurement and analysis that tend to dominate the social sciences and i think even the humanities but at least the humanities seem to be a little bit better geared to be a, be able to think through these things but it's something that doesn't get nearly as much attention and i think that it's actually potentially the most important thing for us to consider because it's part of the economic and it's part of the geopolitical because if you can control subjects if you can conform subjects to particular political and economic regimes then you have docile bodies so to speak or you have libidinal investments into the system so that's what i worry about yeah i 100 percent agree with that and that's uh my biggest concern as well yeah yeah well, shoot, man. I, I almost wonder, like, can you even do a podcast that doesn't talk about coronavirus? Like, is is that just, like, in poor taste? I feel like every podcast now has to be about this, especially since every yeah, they're, they're... every day is, like, a week. I wake up, and I feel like I've just got a week <laughs> know, of information. Right? <laughs> so I feel like a week from now, it's going to be seven months. So we might as well just fucking figure out, see where the world is uh, in a week from now, which is, you know, ridiculous. So yeah, go ahead. What were you going to say? Yeah, I mean, it's there's there's some sense in which like escape is important, right? Um, and so I, I applaud those who are still doing their their normal shit and trying to give <laughs> people an avenue for escape from from Twitter and from all the disinformation and shit that goes on out there. But uh, yeah, for for those who are trying to stay abreast of like current issues and stuff, I don't I don't know how you could possibly just like hunker down and try and do independent <laughs> work right now. I can't like, how do you not just read about all this stuff? Like it, it seems like. I know. And maybe it's it's probably not most of it's not fundamentally important to your life, right? But I don't know how you stay away from it. Yeah. I know. I wonder if it everything's going to be something plus corona, right? So it'll be like the election <laughs> plus corona, film plus corona, you know? Like it's always going to have some sort of how do we talk about this while we're in lockdown? How does this affect while the economy is totally slowed? <laughs> so I know. All right, so I guess we'll go ahead and wrap up there, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Cool, cool, cool. Well, thanks so much, everybody, for uh, for sticking around with us and chatting with us. If you've got any thoughts on this, I know this is an anxious time. You know, definitely feel free to comment below if you are accessing this on the website. You can comment below the file there, um, or you can email us. You can hit us up on Twitter, owls underscore at underscore Don, um, whatever. Feel free to reach out, contribute your thoughts, things like that. And uh, yeah, we are going to be back now. I uh, took some time off, just things were overwhelming, and then I got sick, and all I was doing was sleeping for a couple weeks. So 
But we're going to be back to normal now. So uh, definitely hit us up and uh, yeah, we'll continue to kind of work through things, whether it's Corona related or otherwise, as we tend to do. Yeah, we'll do other things too. It won't be all Corona all the time here on Now's It Done. I know. And plus, I got to continue to talk about like skincare regimes and things like that. Like, how do you take <laughs> care of your skin while you're in the age of Corona? Oh, damn it. See, I With couldn't no even talk. To vitamin B, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I will say this. I am struggling.com that I can't swim every day because my pool is fucking <laughs> closed. And it is fucking brutal. I can already tell. I've put on a little bit of flab and it's making me angry. So part of that is also that I haven't been eating as well. And I did go on a little bit of a bender where I drank a little bit um, before I went into lockdown. So put on a little bit of uh, an extra layer and I'm angry at myself for putting on that layer. And so I got to start working out in the backyard with my kettlebells and shit, I guess. So yeah, I'm dude, sure we're I'll... all going to have that. We're all going to have that quarantine 15. <laughs> the quarantine 15. That's right. Yeah, that's absolutely right. So, all right, sweet. Well, I think that's pretty much everything that we have to say, unless there's anything else you want to contribute to this, Troy. Just one more thing I can think of, dude. What's that? Dasvidaniya, Merikonsky. Which is very real right now. <laughs>